straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. And they are replete with racist and bigot remarks. Prosecutors accuse three defendants of targeting a black man in Georgia. Why text messages and Facebook posts might be admitted into evidence in the Ahmaud Arbery case. Plus, were officers justified in the Breonna Taylor shooting? An inside look into the grand jury proceedings and exclusive analysis from our experts. And a defendant proves her attorney botched her case. So why does the prosecution get to read her defense attorney's private files? Law and Crime Daily covers court cases from coast to coast. And welcome to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Aaron Keller along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. And we're glad you're with us. Let's start in Texas where a police officer is facing murder charges. Terry Austin has this developing story. Terry. Aaron, the officer is facing murder charges for shooting and killing an unarmed man outside of a gas station. The Texas Rangers say Wolf City police officer Sean Lucas responded to a disturbance call and encountered 31-year-old Jonathan Price. The officer reportedly attempted to detain Price, and Price was walking away when Lucas tased him and shot him. A spokesperson for the Texas Rangers said Lucas's actions were, quote, not objectionably reasonable. An attorney for Price's family says Price was a hometown hero and a stand-up guy and was only trying to help a woman out of a domestic violence situation. Lucas is out of jail on a $1 million bond. Thanks, Terry. Let's head to Georgia now, where Law & Crime Daily's Brian Buckmeyer has the latest developments in the Ahmad Arbery case. Brian. Georgia prosecutors say they have proof of a motive in the deadly shooting of a man out jogging earlier this year. Three defendants are charged with killing 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery. Prosecutors say Gregory McMichael started chasing Arbery as he left a construction site. Son Travis McMichael is accused of firing the shots. William Brody Bryan is charged with blocking Arbery with his vehicle and joining the chase. All three are claiming self-defense. But in a court motion just filed, the state says data collected through a search of their electronic devices reveals a racial motive. Among the messages found, on Travis McMichael's Facebook, authorities say they have what they describe as a racial highway video post and a racial Johnny Rebel post. From Gregory McMichael, an identity Dixie post and a racial Johnny Rebel post. And apparently, they found racist text messages on William Bryan's phone. Prosecutors reveal the messages at a bond hearing over the summer. We have a number of text communications that were extracted from this defendant's phone, and they are replete with racist and bigot remarks and communications, which goes directly to the risk of flight and concern that this defendant might pose a risk uh, once the Department of Justice has time to digest, digest this. Repeatedly, this defendant uses the N-word, a term that I had to look up, bootlet, uh, talks about monkey parades working like an end today. There's just a, a ton of filth in this defendant's text regarding that. And one of the investigators on this case testified during a pretrial hearing that while at the crime scene, Brian told him that he overheard one of the other defendants use the N-word. Saying that it might be a, a little uncomfortable to talk about the words because it involves a, a curse word and something else. I need to ask you about that quote. Can you please articulate for the court what Mr. Brian said he heard Travis McMichael say prior to police arriving and after the fatal shooting? Yes, um, Mr. Brian said that after the shooting took place, before police arrival, while Mr. Aubrey was on the ground, that he heard Travis Michael make the statement. I spoke recently with the director of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation about the Ahmad Arbery case. He said the arrest came quickly once the state stepped in. Once the Georgia Bureau of Investigation became involved in that case, within a 36, 38 hour time frame, we had warrants issued for the arrest of two individuals. We conducted the remainder of our investigation uh, before we made a decision that probable cause existed to arrest the third defendant. We did that. Uh, at this point, it, it, it's dependent on the court system working. I've been involved in that system my entire life in some, uh, some aspect of it or another. I've, wit I've been a witness. I've been a prosecutor. I've been a defense attorney. I've been a judge. And I'm confident that the system will work in this case. Does it work fast enough? No, never. 
never does, particularly if you have a loved one in it or you have some personal involvement in it. But I am absolutely, categorically, 100% confident that it's going to work in this case and that in the end, justice will prevail. Brian and Terry here now with Tiffany Simmons, an attorney from Atlanta, Georgia. So, Tiffany, prosecutors are saying they want to get these so-called racial text messages and statements into the cases for two reasons. One of those reasons is under Rule 404, the Rules of Evidence. As evidence, they're saying, as a pattern of conduct. So, is your sense that this is strong enough evidence to meet the conduct requirements, or is it character evidence, because character evidence is inadmissible generally? Well, according to the federal rules of evidence, um, you are correct. Character evidence is inadmissible. However, when you're using the evidence to show, um, to prove motive, to prove um, opportunity, to prove intent, preparation, planning, and knowledge, that is permissible in court. So for the purposes of this case, those emails and text messages, if they can show opportunity, intent, motive, um, planning, knowledge, it is admissible in court. So the key is the if you use there, Tiffany, you have to have a pretty strong chain or nexus to prove that this evidence is directly related to what's alleged. Well, you do. However, um, I believe that if they just show that, again, that this goes towards the motive, um, opportunity, then it should be able to be admiss admissible. And that's really up to the judge. Certainly, Brian. Another reason prosecutors want these messages into the case is just as intrinsic evidence, basically simply saying, this is evidence in a document. We should be able to present it. It's the defendant's own words. Exactly. And the fact that you had, as we saw earlier, that officer come up and saying, these are words that the defendant used, Travis McMichael used, after shooting and killing Ahmaud Arbery. I mean, what, what Tiffany's talking about, the acronym we use, he used, is MIMIC. Uh, it's motive, intent, mistake, or lack thereof, identity, and common scheme of plan. The first three being motive, intent, or lack of mistake are pretty strong on the prosecutor's side when it comes to this evidence coming in. So, Terry, if this evidence gets in, it's damaging for these defendants. Does it get in, in your opinion? I think it could get in, Aaron, and I agree with Brian and Tiffany. It definitely shows some motive here, the reason why they went after a modern Arbery. And, you know, I think what the judge overall has to weigh is whether it's more probative than it is prejudicial, et cetera. And I think it could get in. Yeah, we have other rules of evidence that we need to sort these through, too, not just that 404 character versus conduct. We've got to have basic relevance standards as well. Great discussion on that case and still ahead here on Law and Crime Daily. A Supreme Court justice with harsh words about whether prosecutors are playing fairly in a case that she reviewed. But first, a closer look at the grand jury's decision to charge one officer but not any others in the police shooting of Breonna Taylor. Law and Crime Daily returns in just a moment. Let's head now to Louisville, Kentucky, and the deadly no-knock warrant in the Breonna Taylor case. Kentucky's Attorney General has released 15 hours worth of recordings from those grand jury proceedings, and Law and Crime Daily's Brian Buckmeyer has been combing through them over the weekend and including into today. Brian? Yeah, so it's been a lot. When you when you look at them all, at the end of the day, what's really difficult, is you, you don't get the charges that the grand jury actually had at the end of the day. We don't know what if at all, the prosecutor said is self-defense, is manslaughter, is homicide. We don't even know if homicide or manslaughter were told to the, the grand jury. And so at the end of the day, all the facts and information that I have the ability to comb through is really for nothing when we don't get that, that, that last bit at the end. The prosecutors presented evidence over two and a half days, and they laid out a timeline of events uh, starting from when the officers arrived at Taylor's house on March the 13th. Investigators say the officers executing the warrant were not wearing body cameras, but jurors were able to watch his body cam videos from backup uh, responding to the house after the shooting. They also listened to the 911 calls from Taylor's neighbors and from her boyfriend, Kenny Walker. Members of the jury questioned why there was a five-minute time lapse between 911 calls. The officers got on scene about 0035, March 13th. They begin to execute the warrant, 0040. These are files, but nobody's going to watch it. 0040. The first 911 call comes from Kim. It 
12.43.52 seconds. Next call that we have here is 12.44.08. Next we have 12.45, we don't have the second on that one, 0.045. And then Walker calls, Kenneth Walker calls from the apartment four at 12.50 and 13 seconds. Now I can't begin to speculate that what he was doing and why he waited over the day is all those other times. So obviously it's either they were made nine one call they were not in the department shooting day. Yeah, right. Let's see that 1245, that lady said they were still shooting. You are. Yeah. Attorney Ben Crump represents Brianna Taylor's family. He said Taylor's boyfriend had every right to fire his gun in self-defense on who he thought was an intruder, but who turned out to be the police. Brianna didn't have a gun. Brianna uh, didn't pose a threat to anybody. She was literally in her underwear. And by Officer Maddenly's own account, he said in his statement that he knew that Brianna was unarmed. So if you knew that, then why would you be shooting at an unarmed black woman in her own apartment? And I have to say this, Kenny Walker, Brianna's boyfriend, who is a law-abiding citizen, never committed a crime in his life, never been arrested in his life, a registered gun owner. Doesn't he have a right to the Second Amendment didn't Kenny Walker have the right to self-defense? So shouldn't all of these facts be presented to the grand jury so they can deliberate as to if the police violated policies and procedures and it was their actions that was the proximate cause that caused Breonna Taylor to be killed? And at least the recommendation of second-degree manslaughter should go forward. So, Terry, we really get into a collision of law here, because if the police are fired upon, they have a legal right to defend themselves. As to the person who's firing, the person who believes he's being invaded has a legal right to defend his castle. And we have Breonna Taylor, who, by all accounts, is an innocent third-party victim here. Well, that's exactly right, Aaron. And I agree with Crump here. You know, Mattingly did say that he saw she did not have a gun. So why did he shoot in her direction? And the fact that so many bullets were shot, obviously Hankinson shot indiscriminately in a neighboring apartment. But the fact that we have someone who died, Cosgrove and Mattingly, in fact, all three of them should have at least manslaughter charges against them for irrecklessly, you know, killing someone who was happening to stand next to her boyfriend. Brian, can the officers in any way be excused here because they're reviewed uh, statements that the grand jury reviewed basically suggest, oh, it was chaos, we had flashes of light, we just started firing. Is that not excusable? It's excusable from, like, jury nullification or saying, hey, officers had a hard job, which they do, and I understand. But from a legal standpoint, the only two questions you have to ask yourself is, one, was this manslaughter? Did he intend to cause injury to one person and, in fact, kill a third party? And two, did he respond to someone's use of force appropriately? And here, as it applies to Breonna Taylor, he didn't, because Breonna Taylor didn't apply any force to him. Tiffany, your thoughts on this quickly. Should there have been additional charges filed against these officers? Yes, there should have been additional charges. Um, 11 of the 12 witnesses said that they did not hear the police officers announce that they were at the door. Um, at best, this was a botched uh, raid, and they should be charged accordingly. I appreciate the insight, Tiffany, from Georgia. Very good to have you on Law & Crime Daily. The rest of us will be back in a moment because still ahead tonight, a lurking defendant and an out of control wildfire. Some footage you don't want to miss is right after this. Cameras capture many crazy moments in courtrooms where they're allowed. Court Cam by Law & Crime Productions airs on the A&E Network. Here's our founder, Dan Abrams. First, we head to Superior Court in Orange County, California, for a not-so-typical arraignment hearing. All right, let's go forward then on the case of Forrest Gordon Clark. That's 51-year-old Forrest Gordon Clark in the orange jumpsuit behind the screen. Birthday, 29. 
Is that your birthday, Mr. Clark? Rather than answering the judge, Clark lurks in the background, seemingly more preoccupied with the court's cameras. So how exactly did he end up here? Clark's accused of starting the devastating Holy Fire in Cleveland National Forest in Orange and Riverside counties. The fire forced over 20,000 people in neighboring communities to evacuate and took over a month to contain. For his alleged actions, Clark's facing a litany of charges, including aggravated arson, arson of inhabited property, and arson of a forest. Clark lived in one of the 14 cabins located in the area of the fire. And his is the only one still standing. In addition, Clark reportedly had conflicts with his neighbors for years and even sent a text warning a volunteer fire chief that, quote, the place will burn. Birthday 29. Is that your birthday, Mr. Clark? 29. Making matters even more bizarre, today's hearing was scheduled a day earlier, but Clark refused to leave his cell to attend. All right, he's declining. Yay. Pardon? Yay. Yay? Okay, thank you, sir. Perhaps for seeing the disruptive idea. behavior, his attorney, sure Nicole Parnas, even requested he not be present. But All that right, was denied by a court then. commissioner. And now the judge is struggling to lay out the formal charges with Clark present. Uh, Mr. Clark is charged in several counts involving arson, aggravated arson. That's a lie. Criminal uh, threats. These are just allegations, sir, and resisting. Correct. Ms. Parnas, you wish to continue the arraignment? Your Honor? Yes. Correct. Yay. Okay. All right, then your order back on August 17th. That'll be for further arraignment. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, sir. We'll see you then. Bail has been set at $1 million. And, and your Honor, remain. may I pay for that and immediately? Honor, can we please have a bail? Can I post all? bail? Also set on the 17th? Yes. I can handle, bail. No, I can no. handle a million right now, easily. You don't need to. Just everyone quiet. Eventually, Clark pleads not guilty to the charges. And later, two counts of resisting are dropped. Clark remains in custody as he awaits a trial. If convicted, he could face life in prison. Correct. Yay. OK. And when we come back, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor on a case where a jury convicted a defendant not once but twice and what the justice thinks was unfair about the verdicts. Justice Sonia Sotomayor raising questions in a Supreme Court document about the ethics of prosecutors in cases where defendants complain about their lawyers. Here are just some of the twists and turns. At trial, defendant Reminder Cower was convicted of first-degree murder in Maryland, but she argued on appeal that her defense attorney provided ineffective assistance. In order to convince a court that her attorney performed poorly, the Maryland judicial system forced Cower to hand defense documents over to the very same prosecutors who tried her a second time and who won a second conviction against her. Cower appealed again, saying it was unfair under the Sixth Amendment for prosecutors to see her first defense attorney's files. The appeals court ruled against her, saying she failed to demonstrate a realistic possibility that she was harmed in the second trial by the prosecutor's access to her privileged information or that the prosecutors used such information to their advantage. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to take up the matter, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor agreed that the case should end. But she wrote separately, saying the prosecution could have been aided, even subconsciously, by reviewing the defense files. And Sotomayor notes the defendant herself refused to testify at her second trial because of what the prosecution knew from those files. Prosecutors wield an immense amount of power, and they do so in the name of the state itself, Sotomayor wrote. That unique privilege comes with the exceptional responsibility to ensure that the criminal justice system indeed serves the ends of justice. Prosecutors
prosecutors fall short of this task and therefore do a grave disservice to the people in whose name they litigate when they permit themselves to enjoy unfair trial advantages at defendant's expense. Here, the prosecutors should have recused themselves from participating in Cower's second trial as a matter of professional conscience. Their failure to do so casts a troubling and unnecessary shadow over Cower's conviction and sentence to life imprisonment. Okay, Brian, there's a lot of moving parts in this. The, Justice Sotomayor is basically saying the prosecutors should have recused themselves from the case because they saw the files. The second trial was predicated on a jailhouse statement from the defendant, the wife, basically said that her husband drugged her and that she really wasn't involved in the crime with him. That was the two of them together there in the gun store surveillance video we saw. So there's a lot of odd layers to this. But the big question is, why is the prosecutor getting the files to make the decision, not the judge? This makes no sense on, on so many levels, Aaron. When it comes to ineffective assistance of counsel, it's the defense attorney, usually the new one, arguing that the last one did something improper to the court. It's a two-part test under Strickland, one for performance, one for prejudice. And nowhere in that, in that argument is the prosecutor even involved, so why they're getting the file makes no sense. Furthermore, when they get that file, they should be recused, because even as defense attorneys, we can't represent two people from the same case because that would be a conflict and that would make us ineffective in representing our own clients. So prosecutors would fall into the same category. Yeah, I mean, once you get the file, arguably, you become a witness in the proceeding as well. And that's another way you could look at this too. And that causes a problem. So, so Terry, Justice Sotomayor's statement doesn't carry the weight of law. It's basically in, it's an opinion on a denial to take a case, but it does give a bit of a roadmap for future cases. She's saying maybe the next case could cause a big problem with this too. Well, yeah, I agree. I mean, she was, you know, ultimately agreed on the end, end result here, mm -hmm. but she's trying to make a statement, I think, to everybody that prosecutions shouldn't yeah. work in this We got to wrap up. We'll see you next time.